deep flavor can't be rushed. Tenderizing takes time. And if you're going to dedicate more time to cooking, why not start perfecting your skills on the methods that take a little bit more time? These are the cooking methods that you've dismissed until now because you just don't have the time. Until now. Because these are the days to braise on the Carefree Cooks Code. I'm Chef Todd Moore, and this is the Carefree Cook's Code, every Tuesday live at noon Eastern. Here's our challenge. How can home cooks cook freely with creativity, confidence, and pride while ignoring recipes and still impressing themselves and others with what they cook? Well, the answer is found in becoming empowered with how cooking works, using dependable and repeatable methods of cooking that work for any ingredient, for any diet, and any desire, just like chefs do. And we'll know we've cracked it when everyone sees cooking as an exciting and rewarding way to improve their relationships, their lifestyles, and their health through better food and cooking. This is the Carefree Cook's Code. Hey, welcome back to the Carefree Cook's Code, everyone. This is the free, public, weekly show for the methods, techniques, and insights into better food and cooking. We're live every Tuesday at noon Eastern right here on my Chef Todd Moore page on Facebook. It's a free class open to the public. Share it with as many people as you would like. Uh, and if you'd like to get an email reminder of when I'm going live, sign up at webcookingclasses.com slash Live And if you want to see what I've been cooking when we're not together, uh, hear how I did it, follow Chef Todd Moore on Instagram as well. Were you there? Uh, there's the point. <laughs> were you there for the lab on Saturday? This is my uh, lamb navarin with nice little cute potatoes and baby carrots and a, a whole bunch of barley. Oh my goodness, it was amazing. Uh, how do we do this? Just constantly make these great meals at home? Well, it's because we're carefree cooks. Uh, we create our own recipes, we bring friends and family together, we learn every time we cook, creating our own cooking style, all by practicing pro methods, and you wind up loving your cooking. Like I said, were you there with us Saturday? It's just the most amazing event. Our lab class was on Zoom this past Saturday. It's just one of the most amazing three hours you can spend on a Saturday. It's what all the cool kids are doing now. So uh, LAB stands for Learn, Act, Become. It's very purposeful, and that's what we did. We made three Savvy Spring Suppers live and in real time, talking, interacting on Zoom. I love it so. Uh, the next one's May 14th, so put that on your calendar. But Saturday's lab showed us that using long, low, slow cooking methods can yield some incredibly flavorful dishes. I mean, <laughs> there was a lot of learning going on on Saturday, and the photos that my insiders posted on our insiders community, mind-blowing, unbelievable. People kept saying, I've never tasted such deep flavor, like the flavor, and that's why it takes time. So I'm confident everybody on Saturday learned at least one thing that is going to make their cooking better, easier, quicker, more prideful if you want. And I'm confident because immodestly nobody teaches the way that I do. These are the things that are discussed in culinary school, not to the general public. Jeez, you know, what's the, why is the idea that every meal needs to be a 30 minute meal, 30 minutes or less, you know? Cooking quickly may not be the best way to develop this kind of flavor in your food. I know it's not the way to tenderize anything. So why are we all in such a rush anyway? This is the question I gotta ask because these long cooking methods are dismissed. When I dedicate some extra time, when I want to cook something really moist and flavorful, like with a, a deep, savory kind of gravy, a cooking method that would help me take tough cuts of meat and make them into fork morsels, fork tender morsels, then, like today, it is the days to braise. But before we get into that, I've got a what am I for you today. Tell me in the comments section below, what am I? braised lamb shank. 
What's it called? Don't, don't write braised lamb shank. Give me the name for this dish in the uh, comment section below. That's our what am I for the week. You know, our carefree cooks, all right, I'm, let, let, me, let me get on one of my soapbox and go on a little bit of a tangent before we get to the braising and stewing methods, before we discuss the difference between braising and stewing, which is the deep dive that we did on Saturday in the, in the lab class. It, it's just amazing to me how our carefree cooks community have been thriving in this environment lately where restaurants close, uh, you know, it, the delivery, takeout, food, it's just not that exciting anymore. It was exciting a year or two ago. It's just not that exciting. And that's because it's become a lot easier and a lot more rewarding to cook your own food at home. If you use dependable, repeatable methods of cooking, you start creating the best food you've ever had at a restaurant or not. And our carefree cooks put the restaurants to shame in their own minds. I hear it. it, it it's There's a certain point in time in a carefree cook's journey where they go out to a restaurant for convenience and they and their spouse look at each other and go, you could have done this better at home. That's, that's a tipping point for carefree cooks. But isn't it amazing the results that you get when you focus on how to cook using reliable steps? I mean, if, if you do what I'm trying to compel you to do, which is use a method right? Not a recipe. And ask yourself what you did well and what you could do better at the end. And then you fill in next time I will and fill in the blank. And that's how you learn when you cook, how you improve each time. And that's when your results are consistently amazing and you don't need restaurants ever again. <laughs> ever again. Uh, look, I'm not trying to gloat here, even though mini, <laughs> mini chef Todd, uh, I do look like I'm gloating, but this picture was taken years ago. So I must have been gloating about something else, but I'm not gloating now. I think that's when the wings were ready. Web cooking classes, lesson week one, bonus video. I, th I think this is when the wing, I get very excited when the wings are ready. But anyway, <laughs> you know, you already know, I want everyone to improve their health, their relationships, their lifestyles through better food and cooking. But if you've been watching any of those food TV shows lately, if you've watched the progression of what has happened to them over the past two years, you see how they have changed their approach over the past two years. You are witnessing everyone starting to come over to our way of thinking. It's the truth. Is Gordon Ramsay yelling at children now? Adults aren't afraid of Gordon Ramsay anymore. He's got he's to scare children out of cooking the way he scares adults out of cooking. You miserable little fourth grader. You're not going to cry, are you? <laughs> Look, I've been teaching dependable and repeatable methods of cooking that bring out confidence and creativity since 2006, okay? Today's challenges are pushing all these celebrity chefs over to our way of thinking. The fact that food is comfort, especially in tough times. Food is love. Food is a comfort to me. Helping others with my cooking is a comfort to me. And instead of making cooking a competition, rather than host their elimination cooking shows, forgetting that their cooking is really all about entertainment. It's not about teaching anybody. But now these celebrity chefs are all changing their tune. They're changing their recipes. I listened to Bobby Flay not long ago, humbly read an essay on a Sunday morning TV show about he's, how he's cooking more simply now, that he's looking for comfort food, not fancy food. And he starts the essay this way. Here's a quote. Today I'm talking to you not as the high-flying battle till I burn down the building iron chef that you see on the food TV, but as the father of a young professional just starting her career. And he goes on too. He says, Firing up the stove is our comfort zone. And we've ever, if we've ever needed comfort, it's now. I never thought the day would come that I agree with Bobby Flay. <laughs> okay, it only took a pandemic for that to happen. But Bobby's right. The advice I have heard from these celebrity chefs on TV since March 2020 is that simpler is better. Comfort is most important. And I really like their message Finally, I <laughs> finally agree with TV chefs. But I got to ask, what happened to the dandelion mash 
frise salad with the pomegranate lychee fruit vinaigrette that you wanted me to make just before the pandemic? You remember? Celebrity chefs, it was all about fancy food. It was all about exotic ingredients back then. Oh, now, now it's all about pantry cooking, right? Now it's all about whipping up great meals from the stuff you already have on hand and letting, instead of letting a recipe or a celebrity chef tell you what to go out and buy. Wow, that is a big shift for them in a short amount of time. So now all these celebrity chefs who wouldn't be caught dead on YouTube two years ago, they're all on YouTube. They're doing Facebook Lives. They're cooking from their home kitchens, trying to connect. And they're giving the advice that any cooking is good cooking now, that it doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be overproduced and highly entertaining. Bobby, put the cat down. <laughs> It's not that bad yet, Bobby. We're, we're not. Would you run out of mash and frise and, and lychee fruit pomegranate? I'm, I'm afraid for, for Bobby Flay. Bobby, I'm here for you. I mean, now that we see eye to eye on things, I'm here. It's okay. You'll get back, back to burning down the kitchen type competition food shows soon. Just please put the cat down. Comfort. Confidence. Pride, those are the keys to cooking. It's what they're saying now. It's a different message from two years ago because are they now saying something like, it's not what you cook, it's how you cook that matters? Eh, a little bit, I think they are. Is the entire food media population stepping down from their high pedestals and saying, hey, if it's good to you, then it's good? Hmm, where have I heard that before? I hope they don't start saying it's not fine cooking, it's cooking coarse, because then that's going to get really eerie. And if that's the case, they're about 14 years too late, way behind us, the carefree cooks. But thank you for allowing me to vent, but that's not what I came to talk about today. We're, we're here together today to talk about the low and the slow. And now that we all have more time to cook, and have developed maybe a little bit more patience in cooking, now that everybody is telling us cooking is about comfort, right? Let's use the cooking methods that take more time, that take a little bit more patience and give you way more comfort because they yield totally different results than the quicker cooking methods. And there are so many advantages to cooking this way. Everybody saw it on Saturday. And that's why these are the days to braise. Because stewing and braising are combination cooking methods that both use dry and moist heat. So in both of these methods, the first step is usually to brown your main item using dry direct heat. Put something in the pan, psh, get it brown, right? The second step is the important one is to simmer or steam the food in a liquid. So combination cooking methods are fantastic for, for taking something that's less tender, but more flavorful, those cuts of meat that are cheaper, um, as well as poultry and, and, and even vegetables, because this is a common mistaken belief and one I've even perpetrated myself, I'll admit, that braising and stewing are only meant for tough cuts of meat. And I've come to realize that's not true. Braised poultry, braised duck, braised root vegetables, cauliflower. Cauliflower doesn't need any tenderization over a long period of time, but braising and stewing are these great combination cooking methods because they use both that direct conductive heat and the indirect moist heat. And the real difference between braising and stewing is really just the amount of liquid. Braising and stewing are great cooking methods once you have the time because they can tenderize tough cuts of meat, right? They add a pronounced flavor due to this long cooking process. They cook meat, vegetables, even rice and grains at the same time in one pan. Have you ever made paella? Paella is a braised dish. They make their own sauce. <laughs> That's awesome. You don't have to make a sauce. And it's kind of a forget it set it and forget it way of cooking. One of the few ways of cooking you can kind of walk away from. And I really hate to put it this way, but it's kind of like a crock pot, I think. I, I don't speak crock pot, but 
it's like crock pot when you don't have a crock pot. And I don't, I don't own one of those, so I, I really couldn't say. But let's go through the procedure for braising. First, you, you trim, cut, prep the food to be braised. Now, it's important to take away any renderable fat because it'll melt and then it makes your sauce very greasy. So if you're going to braise something, trim as much fat from it as you can. Number two, since you're using tougher cuts of meat, which is usually elastin and collagen, you need to cut away that, that gray elastin fat, the rubber band kind of thing that won't cook away even in braising. So now is the time for your boning knife. Remove the fat, the elastin, the connective tissue that won't cook away and the soft white fat that will render, it will melt, but you want to take that away too. Otherwise Otherwise you get a really greasy sauce. The second step would be to dredge your item in flour if you want. That'll add the thickening agent, but there's another way to do that that we'll talk about in a minute. Second thing is heat your pan. Add some fat until it gets hot enough to start to cook. If it's butter, that means it starts to get bubbly before brown. If it's oil, that means it begins a convection and starts to ripple, things you can see with your eyes. Now here's another difference between braising and stewing. In braising, you want as much contact with the heat without submerging the item in anything. So a braising pan is usually a much wider pan in diameter with much shorter sides because braising has a steaming element to it. The, the item isn't totally submerged in the liquid. There's a, there's a head space. We call it head space gap between the top of the liquid and the, the bottom of the lid that allows for this flavorful steam to get caught, condense, rain back down to circulate in the pan. But with stewing, the food is supposed to cook entirely in the moist convective heat by simmering or poaching and then letting the moisture evaporate. So that's why a stewing pan is more like a, a saucepan. It has a narrower diameter and much higher sides because you're gonna fill it up with liquid and you want the food to be totally submerged. Does that make sense? A, a, a braising pan in a commercial kitchen is called a rondeau. Um, you see one at the opening of Carefree Cook's Code every week, the, the culinary student with the huge spoon and the rondeau. Uh, step three, brown the food on all sides with direct conductive heat. And this is where you'll get the pan nice and hot like you're about to saute, like you're about to start the nine steps in the saute method. Whether you're braising or stewing, we're doing the same thing to this point, okay? Pan hot first, fat, brown the item. So you might choose to remove the heat from uh, the meat from the pan here, return it later, or leave it in there. The next is saute the other ingredients in the rendered fat, in that fond. So are you using onions, carrots, celery, daikon, parsnips, lotus root, any other harder vegetable, right? Now is the time to subject them to the, to the direct conductive heat in browning like the meat. So you've got the rendered fat from the meat, you saute your items, or like I said, you could go vegetarian, just the olive oil, saute the aromatics. And remember, you gotta match your knife skills, right, to the cooking method as well. This is where knife skills are always important. These days to braise, uh, they're not the days to use little tiny brunoise cuts, right, an eighth of an inch cube, because they'll disintegrate over five hours of cooking. This is where you might use your medium or large dice cuts because they'll be tender and they'll be fork sized by the time that they're done cooking for hours. Here is where you can now add flour to create a pan roux or um, spoon in a previously made roux, get your cornstarch slurry rate ready because this is the thickening part. Or like I said, you could delay your thickening agent for a little while. You've removed the item from the pan and add a few more steps to deglaze the pan with a flavorful liquid. This is where your wine comes in, red wine, white wine, liquors, bourbons. And if you don't drink alcohol or cook with it, a nice stock flavorful liquid. If you're cooking meats or game, I recommend red wine. If you're cooking poultry or vegetables, Eh, I recommend red wine, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, but you can use white wine, uh, chicken broth, uh, brandy, cognac, port, something that's going to complement the flavor without overpowering it. Now remember, in braising, the sauce is going to reduce 
and the flavors will intensify. That's the idea. So if the wine you're using tastes bad in the glass, it's going to be five times as bad if you use it for a braising liquid. You have to let the wine reduce until your pan is almost dry. A common misconception, you don't ever make a sauce out of wine. The flavor, the grape flavor of the wine gets into the aromatics and it's reduced until it's almost dry. This is called au sec in French culinary. So now's the time for your cooking liquid. And again, it's not wine. We're not cooking in wine, but it's probably a chicken, a beef, a vegetable, mushroom, broth, or stock. And if you're braising, the ingredients are covered halfway. Add the liquid halfway up to the chicken breast or the, the beef or whatever it is you're braising. If you're stewing, the ingredients are covered entirely. And you want that liquid to reduce and evaporate as much as possible. But one of the keys in braising and stewing is to have an acidic ingredient. Acids break down connective tissues in meat. So th this is the tenderizing effect that you get in braising. If you don't add some kind of acid, it's not gonna work as well because this is the effect that you're looking for. Take those cheap stew cuts, the, the lamb that was all marbleized that we worked with on Saturday and add tomatoes, tomato paste, lemon juice, orange juice, citrus, flavored vinegars, acidic condiments are added to the cooking liquid to achieve this tenderizing effect. And if you made a roux in the previous step, well, your liquid is gonna start to thicken. If not, now's the time for your cornstarch slurry, your previously made roux, whatever. Now is the time to add your thickening liquid, uh, thickening agent, because the cooking liquid is gonna heat up and reach the temperature of gelatinization of starches at about 150 degrees Fahrenheit or 65 Celsius. This is when it starts to absorb that liquid and swell, this thickens your sauce. Or look, you could further delay it, thicken the braising liquid at the very end. So just continue to steam, 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 and then at the end, thicken that sauce if you want. Do it either way. If you remove the meat from the pan before, put it back in now and let it cook in that moisture, flavor, and steam. In braising, cover the pan. Bring the cooking liquid to a very soft simmer on the stove top, or you could actually put it in the stove. Uh, you can continue braising in the stove in an oven safe pan at about 250 degrees Fahrenheit or 120 Celsius for as long as you want. You leave it in the oven all day if you want. No worries <laughs> about checking to see when it's done. No worries about internal temperatures here. I'm pretty sure a braised item is not going to be rare. <laughs> it's not going to be unsafe after cooking for three, four, five hours. Because the goal in braising is to flavor and tenderize. When your meat falls apart under the fork, when, when your carrots are so soft and flavorful, you have reached the end of the days to braise. And here's, here's the last important difference between braising and stewing. Braising is usually lid on, stewing is usually lid off. This one tip has changed people's chilies, has changed people's beef bourguignon and, and beef stroganoff. The idea is that you wanna capture the moisture and use the steam in braising and then reduce the liquid later or thicken it but in stewing, you want it to evaporate as it cooks to make that stew gravy in there, right? But again, these methods are all up to your interpretation. People don't tell you that recipes are up to your interpretation. I'll tell you these methods are up to your interpretation. Stewing normally doesn't get a thickening agent. Just the reduction is thick enough. And if you've put potatoes in your stew, you're gonna get thick. If you put tomato paste, in your stew, it's gonna get thickener because the reduction in a stew should be the thickener. But you know, if I keep brown roux cubes in my freezer, ding, I might throw in one in every once in a while, tenderize with tomato paste, thicken it up. Um, you could also remove the lid from the pan while braising. If your liquid is too thin, you're getting toward the end, let that liquid reduce to further thicken the sauce. It's all up to you. Uh, you could puree all your vegetables and the cooking liquid. Imagine taking all the carrots out and pureeing them, adding it back to the liquid, that'll be a thickening agent. But look, you don't have to do any of these things <laughs> because once you're confident in methods, then you can change them. 
or alter the ingredients. You make something new all the time, something exciting each time when you cook this way. When you cook by method, you have a tendency to go squirrely this way, a, a little bit of side trip that way, but it always comes out to something amazing, right? Do you remember what I probably said to you at your, the very beginning of your Carefree Cook's journey? Do you remember learn the rules like a pro so you can break them like an artist? A Pablo Picasso quote that I love. Yeah, you can always break the rules. You don't have to follow recipes at all, but you better have a background a safety net in how to cook. Because to me, this is one of the most comfort producing ways to cook. It fills, the smells fill your house all day long. You get something really flavorful, really tender that honestly takes very little effort. I mean, not even Bobby Flay is gonna argue with you about that anymore. <laughs> he used to. Have, have you seen his cat lately? Anyone? Look, when it comes to seasonings in a stewed and braised item, let me leave you with this tip. Be, be very careful. If you have an item that's going to cook for a very long time, you can't use any fresh whole leaf seasonings, especially at the beginning. They wilt. You know, they lose their flavor. They, they don't last long in a moist combination cooking method. And like I said before, if you think about using dry seasonings, like making tea, the longer you steep the tea, the stronger the tea is, you might start to use dry seasonings in your braising because of the long cooking times. And you can always adjust the flavors at the end. So the days to braise are, are the days of comfort, are, are the days of, of deep flavor, tenderization and moisture. And even the celebrity chefs are talking about it now. Uh, let's get back to the what am I for today. How many of you knew Asobuco? Yeah, braised lamb shank. Uh, if you like Asobuco, you really like it. If you don't like Asobuco, you really hate it. There's, <laughs> there's no in between. So maybe you should try and get a hold of some lamb shank. Uh, bring it home, follow the steps that I told you about, and make it one of those days to braise. And might you know someone who has a lot more time to cook lately? Well, it's time to tell them about the days to braise. So please like, share this video with your friends and people that want better cooking at home. And are you ready to start your own culinary journey toward true freedom in the, cook, in the kitchen? You're ready to go, I can help you. Because there's gonna be some decisions to make. There's gonna be some forks in the road that you're gonna to need to navigate along the way. And I can help you do that with my free guidebook. It's the five forks to carefree cooking. I'll help you make the right decisions. Go right, go left. You'll become a confident and creative home cook. Go to fiveforksguide.com and download your copy today. So until next Tuesday at noon Eastern time, this is Chef Todd Moore reminding you that there's a method to your long, slow, tender, flavorful cooking success.